Good evening. I'm the Reverend Dr. Nancy Claire Pittman, and it is my privilege to be the president of this organization, Phillips Theological Seminary, and to welcome you to the inauguration of the Phillips Theological Seminary Tulsa Race Massacre Lectureship. On behalf of the board and trustees, the faculty, staff, and students of this remarkable community, I express our genuine joy in seeing you here in this physical or digital space. We are delighted that you have come with us on this journey we here at Phillips are dedicated to teaching and learning the way of Jesus in and for this particular moment in the 21st century. And so tonight we invite you to join with us in the tasks of remembering our common past and then working toward restoration of wholeness for God's people reparation for those who have been harmed and one day, God willing, eventual reconciliation with one another. Now I'll tell you, remembering the past is a slippery business. Some people really do have the luxury of choosing what they will remember. Others who are so indelibly marked by the events that haven't happened have no choice but to remember. Still others were never given the choice to know what had happened. With truth is withheld and hidden. And then there are all those who claim to remember what happened, but prefer to tell us the story in a way that avoids pain and responsibility. Faithful remembering requires the willingness to see, to look at multiple dimensions of a story, especially as it is told by the perspective of those most harmed by the event. To hear truth, even when it hurts, and to challenge status quo explanations. Tonight, we are going to continue in that ongoing struggle to remember so well that we commit and we recommit ourselves to rectifying the injustices of the past and offering the full shalom that Jesus offers as our future. So we begin by remembering that this land, this land where we stand, where we sit, was once inhabited by the peoples of the Osage Nation, the Cherokee Nation, and the Creek Muscogee Nation. We remember that this corner of Northeast Tulsa was once tended and loved by the people of these nations and promised to them eternally by the U.S. government. This sacred land is now stained by their blood, shed as their land was taken, and it is scarred by the sin of slavery carried here from the eastern and southern parts of the United States, the deep inequities of racism permeates its geography as surely as oil and other precious minerals do. The landscape is marked with visible and invisible symbols of human inhumanity. 
So we're going to remember all these things tonight, even as we focus our attention on the events of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921. Dr. Angela D. Sims will invite us to consider in our souls the malevolence of ignorance. DBR, Dr. Daniel Romain, and Olivia Davis, whose parents are here, by the way, will ask us to hear both hope and pain in their music just as awesome Jeremy and other artists call us to see the massacre and its century-long reverberations. Special thank you to Dr. Lee H. Butler, Jr., and to the staff, and to the faculty, and to the contributors who planned this lectureship and made it possible tonight. Don't walk out now. <laughs> We're here in this together. Welcome to this most sacred evening of story, song, and art. Let us remember together. Amen. Hello, my name is Daniel Bernard Remain, DBR. I am so happy to be able to share this moment with all of you. I wish I could be there physically in that space with you, but technology is going to allow us to be together. I want to thank Phillips Theological Seminary, and in particular, President Nancy Pittman and Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean Lee Butler for inviting me to share time with you tonight. And I'm so happy that I can share some of my music with you tonight that I think speaks to the horror of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Tonight you'll hear two of my compositions, They Still Want to Kill Us, for piano and voice, and my rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Both of these songs, both of these melodies, I think, capture and conjure up hope and freedom. As a black Haitian American composer, I am particularly concerned with this notion of a shared radical morality. We're not there yet, but can we get to a place where truly Black Lives Matter, can we get to a place where we can understand what it means when I say they still want to kill us? And can we get to a place where yes, we can lift every voice and sing? I'm so humbled by the fact that this aria, They Still Want to Kill Us, is making its debut with you tonight in Tulsa. It was written for Opera Tulsa, and because of the words, it was rejected by that organization. As BIPOC people, we were able to rally up together and find a way to create a film and find a way to have this music come alive. I will be playing the piano tonight, and we have a wonderful singer who will be collaborating with me over time and space, but together with you in spirit and in song. My heart aches for the memories of those who did not survive the Tulsa Race Massacre. My heart is full for the survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre, the survivors. And I'm thinking of love and legacy in this moment. As an artist, I cannot be a first responder, 
but can I be second? Can I be third? Can we all play a part and share an important role in these days of war and death? I ask you, what is the role and responsibility of the living? Is it to affirm life? Can art be resistance? Thank you for taking the time to be here, to support and contribute, and to share in the hard work that lies ahead. But together, as it's always been, we will survive, we will thrive, and we will find new ways to honor, uphold, and love one another. I really thank you. The occasion. <clears throat> I begin with a quote. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. These are the famous words spoken by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in the wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Numerous major motion pictures have been made recounting the events that inspired the acts of heroism to describe the United States as a resilient force. The stories that speak the history of the United States hold Pearl Harbor as a never forget, never again moment. Yet while some historical events have been remembered by the nation, other historical events have been suppressed and hidden within the nation. Before Pearl Harbor was bombed by a Japanese aerial and naval assault in 1941, Black Wall Street was attacked by ground and air forces in 1921. Tonight, Phillips Theological Seminary recalls May 1st through May 31st through June 1st, 1921, the dates, the dates which will live in infamy when the community of Greenwood was assaulted by an empire of hate. The Tulsa Race Massacre Lectureship declares we will remember Greenwood and Black Wall Street as one of the most affluent African-American communities in America. We will remember the self-determination of this all-black community famed as a thriving black metropolis comparable to any thriving urban center in the United States with businesses, entertainment, professionals, health services, hotels, home ownership, churches, and proud people. Greenwood was a shining example of African Americans living in prosperity. The Tulsa Race Massacre Lectureship declares, we will remember that although Tulsa became a land of opportunity in black and white, and a prominent example of living separate and equal, racism loomed large to declare social inequality. Separate but equal was the law of the land, but separate and unequal was the written law within the hearts of Tulsa. We will remember that the massacre began with a failed lynching that in actuality resulted in an entire cultural center being destroyed. The Tulsa Race Massacre Lectureship declares we will remember the lives lost in the massacre bring noted scholars who will promote conversations that help us reflect on the lessons the history offers and interpret the inherited legacies that must be confronted. Engaging Greenwood's prosperity as evidence of faith and conceiving the devastation of Greenwood as the destruction of the household of faith. The traumatic end of Greenwood is the story of how easily the image of God can be distorted and destroyed, as well as the power of resilience and resistance. Tonight, we inaugurate the Phillips Theological Seminary Tulsa Race Massacre Lectureship and declare we will remember Greenwood knowing that black community and lives matter to God as we walk where faith leads us following the way of Jesus.
I also have the privilege of introducing our lecturer. You will find a biographical sketch printed in your program. And I'm delighted to introduce our Phillips Theological Seminary Tulsa Race Massacre inaugural lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Angela Denise Sims, the 13th president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School in Rochester, New York. It's no coincidence that President Sims comes to make her home at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School in Rochester. There is a deep history of resistance and freedom work on behalf of African American humanity within the Finger Lakes region of New York State. The spirits of Harriet Tubman, abolitionist and Underground Railroad conductor, Frederick Douglass, famed author and abolitionist who made a home and is buried in Rochester, and Martin King Jr., the civil rights saint of the 20th century, who earned his basic theological degree from Crozier Seminary, all indwell the region that continues to cry out, freedom, oh, freedom over me. Each of these voices declared that black people have dignity in the eyes of God and black lives matter to the heart of God. These ancestors who are a cloud of freedom fighters witnessing call to this euangelion, this angel to proclaim good news to this Baptist womanist from Louisiana whose parents named her Angela. And she responded to become the first woman president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School with a heritage of preparing an intellectual social justice oriented pastor. President Angela Sims has been called to that seminary by ancestors who affirm her commitments to justice, justice being done on earth as it is in heaven, who confirm her commitments to declare justice in a land that too often is governed by lynch law, who confirm her commitments to proclaim an ethic of care for freedom to reign supreme. In 2014, I, like much of the nation, sat fixed in front of my television, watching the endless and disturbing reports being broadcast from Ferguson, Missouri, in the wake of the killing of Michael Brown. Not knowing how I would navigate my own feelings, I sent a note to Dr. Sims. I wrote, as I watch and listen to the reports, I'm very agitated. Escalation is inevitable. Just a note while I'm trying to breathe. She wrote back. Agitated breathing can lead to creative possibilities to respond to systematic domestic terrorism symbolized by a culture of lynching. In 2020, President Sims blogged. In 1895, Paul Lawrence Dunbar captured the strategies or techniques handed down to generations of blacks on how to navigate 
white domestic terrorism. <clears throat> On this last day of May 2020, might Dunbar's reflection, we wear the mask, challenge us to re-examine ways in which our faith ought to compel us to dismantle oppressive systems, including religious ones. Systems designed to thwart black life. President Sims's scholarly research focuses on the historical and contemporary implications of lynching and the enduring legacy of strange fruit. Whereas the 1921 Tulsa race massacre was initiated by a lynch mob, we are privileged to have President Sims as our inaugural lecturer who will address us from her lecture entitled, Ignorance is Not Benevolent, Violence, Faith, and the Truth Tellers. We are eager to hear what has been handed down through the generations to her for us as we remember Greenwood and Black Wall Street. After our next musical selection from Dr. Daniel Romain, featuring soloist Olivia Davis, the next voice you will hear will be that of the Reverend Dr. Angela Denise Sims, president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. changed. May 31, 1921, 18 hours, 18 hours, a white mob engulfed with white rage. Stumbled upon one another In that elevator everything changed May 31, 1921 18 hours, 18 hours A white mob Burn it down Burn it all down, a white man running with red blood on his hands. Bring it down, bring it all down, a school, the library, my hospital, my church. Burn it down, burn it all down, my people, our black children, our schools, our homes. They want to kill us, they still want to kill us. God bless America, God damn America. Burn it down, burn it all down.
to the members of Phillips Board of Trustees, thank you for supporting the work of this theological seminary. President Pittman, thank you for your collegiality. Thank you for your hospitality. Dean Davis, Dean Butler, we continue to travel this journey together. And so thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your hospitality. I have not had the privilege of meeting Ms. Sharon Russ since I arrived, but I am appreciative of her attention to administrative details that made my trip here one that required no exertion of energy on my part. And to each of you gathered here on this evening, to those of you who are connected with us via technology, and for those of you who will listen to a recording of tonight's inaugural events, let us always remember that the work is never completed. Tonight's keynote is informed by my research on lynching and a culture of lynching in the United States. I am indebted to the many black elders who shared an aspect of their memory with me about a time in this country when mob rule and Southern, although very much national horrors, signaled that black lives did not matter. I begin tonight's remarks with an excerpt from a 1957 sermon, The Birth of a New Nation, that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached in Montgomery, Alabama. Approximately 36 years after the Tulsa Race Massacre, and less than 15 months since his house was bombed by segregationists in retaliation for the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King drew upon his experiences in Ghana and a movement of liberation to abolish colonialism. King wanted those gathered at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church to remember, and I quote, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation. The aftermath of violence are emptiness and bitterness. This is the thing I'm concerned about. Let us fight passionately and unrelentingly for the goals of justice and peace. But let's be sure that our hands are clean in this struggle. Let us never fight with falsehood and violence and hate and malice, but always fight with love so that when the day comes that the walls of segregation have completely crumbled in Montgomery, that we will be able to live with people as their brothers and sisters, close quote. King, acquainted intimately with race, particularly a social cultural construction of a black-white dichotomy in the United States, refused to ignore the crucible of Jim Crow that symbolized neo-slavery and refused to romanticize West Africa as a place of genealogical spiritual connectivity. So given the focus of this inaugural lectureship, most of you recognize that the destruction of black property and the killing of black people with impunity is neither new nor an anomaly. Rather, the ever-present threat of danger in the United States for persons of African descent is a poignant reminder that lynching culture is etched into the DNA of this oligarchic republic that markets itself as a bastion of democracy. In the aftermath of January 6, 2021, we find ourselves increasingly confronted with racial issues that are cloaked in ambiguous national jargon, held in tension and contrasted against contextually informed interpretations and applications. If racial profiling, excessive police force, and occupied neighborhoods are indicators of the United States moral barometer, we are, as oral history participant Mrs. Mordessa Corbin stated, and I quote, really in trouble as a country until we can see how the racial divide is hurting our growth, close quote. 
For Corbin and other black elders who shared their memories of lynching and a culture of lynching in the US with me, the growth to which they refer is not measured in terms of economic profit and loss. Rather, growth is determined by an individual and collective ability to recognize and respect the full human dignity of another person. It is a commitment to dismantle systems designed specifically to use violence to beget violence in a manner that disrupts an often silenced narrative regarding foundational practices traceable to this nation's initial occupation of this land. A memory of lynching, the act itself a form of domestic terror that continues to function symbolically as a mechanism by which to control human behavior, is consciously or not, for many black elders who are now at least 80 years old, a defining moment. How we recover and preserve these narratives that have, in one too many instances, been silenced for decades necessitates that we acknowledge that a culture of fear is still prevalent in the U.S. For as theologian and philosopher Howard Thurman noted, and I quote, when the external circumstances of life are dramatic or unusual, causing the human spirit to make demands upon all the reaches of its resourcefulness in order to keep from being engulfed, then the value of its findings made articulate has more than passing significance. My work on this aspect of life in this country emerges from and is influenced deeply by the almost two years I devoted to document the oral histories of black elders' memories of a culture that lent itself to such barbaric practices. As such, I am unwavering in my assertion that elders who entrusted an aspect of their memory about lynching and a culture of lynching with me represent black prophetic practices. Each contributor has a story to tell about life in the U.S. that often disrupts a carefully crafted version of truth, particularly a national narrative of equality premised on a myth that everyone is in pursuit of an ambiguous monolithic dream. Even if unconsciously aware of an association of power and rhetoric, Oral history participants use language symbolically to describe their understanding of self in relation to others. Their reflections convey an understanding of human dynamics that stand in tension with a basic Christian tenet that all people are created in God's image. Thus, to give voice to dimensions of race as a polarizing religious factor necessitates a re-examination of a universal concept of the Imago Dei. Despite verbal declarations of love of God and all humanity, social historical evidence suggests that encounters by blacks with proponents of lynching and a culture of lynching provide a more accurate depiction of persons of a person's relationship with the divine. This realization of an embodied theology that situates expressions of God in diverse sites of worship, from beyond the confines of a church house to the foot of a lynching tree, contradicts notions of a society premised on law and order. And let me deviate a little bit and say that expressions of God in these diverse worship sites should also cause us to ask, who is the God whom we are serving? When it comes to lynching and a culture of lynching, we must ask ourselves how our response to various expressions of resistance is informed by a culture of terror from which to varying degrees no one is exempt. Since there is no easy way to talk about lynching as a historical contemporary dimension of life in the U.S., I offer as an example of a shared national narrative this excerpt from attorney Donald W. Davis's oral history. Born February 1, 1934, in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, Davis's father, Reverend Robert E. Davis Sr., was the pastor of Mount Olive Baptist Church 
in Sepulpa. His mother, Mrs. Irma Jean Davis, attended a Creek Indian Missionary Boarding School. Davis remarked that he, when he reflects on growing up, and I quote, in a very separate society, close quote, he, and I quote, can see the restraint, close quote. For him, and I quote, ignorance is not benevolent, close quote. To clarify, he said ignorance, and I quote, is not helpful. It doesn't advantage you. And it's like being anesthetized. You may not feel the pain, but the injury is still there. So you are not being helped because you don't feel it, close quote. The first black appointed special judge in the Oklahoma City Municipal Court, Davis was clear that, and I quote, you still feel racism. Racism is still there. The only difference is back in the day, they could take more brutal action against you if they didn't like you, that they don't dare do today, close quote. To contextualize his memory of lynching and a culture of lynching, Davis, born 13 years after the Tulsa Race Massacre, discusses the nexus between race, gender, and economics. His accounting points both to a tradition of oral transmission of history operative in black communities, as well as access to documented accounts of lynching that were printed in black weeklies and other publications. Davis says, and I quote, when that race riot hit, Tulsa probably had a better financial district down in the black community in Greenwood, and probably there were countries that didn't have a developed financial community like that. They traded commodities and futures and things, close quote. According to Davis, and again I quote, the railroad at that time was in Sepulpa. The powers that be wanted to move it to Tulsa. So when Roland got accused of improper attitude that was later elevated to an accusation of attempted rape, and that was the guy's name, he was an elevator operator. It played out. It gave those people, those white people in the other little communities, a chance to address. And David says, I used that only half facetiously. It gave them a chance to address the problems in their community, and it was played out all over the state. It had nothing to do with anything except put them in their place, and the state of Oklahoma aided them aided them because the National Guard went up in there in the first city that was bombed in the United States. Not Pearl Harbor, not Honolulu, but the first city burning in the United States was Tulsa Greenwood. Got those sticks of dynamite down on them and didn't do anything to stop the mob from tearing it up, burning it down. Close quote. Davis's Sepulpa-born friend, Mrs. Nancy Randolph Davis, who in 1949 was the first black student to enroll at Oklahoma State University, then known as Oklahoma A&M College, was born five years after the Tulsa Race Massacre. She remembers her father telling her individuals who were able to escape the horror ran to little towns such as Sepulpa, Bristol, Beggs. According to her, they ran as far as they could. Davis describes herself as just a little girl listening to front porch conversations as her father and neighbors talked about lynching. She recalls them saying, and I quote, boy, they get the Negro and beat him and skin him and put him behind a wagon and drag him, close quote. She remembers them talking about, and again I quote, just how bad it really was, close quote. A friend of Attorney Davis and Mrs. Nancy Davis, Dr. Freddie Foshe Kudjo, shared memories of the Tulsa Race Massacre. She remembers her grandparents, and I quote, had a farm also at a place called Lowry. My grandfather sent all of his girls to the farm in Lowry and armed his sons. 
My uncle Vernon says that he was only six years old, but his grandfather gave him a gun. Black people were ordered out of Sepulpa, Oklahoma to leave it. When they, I guess, marched on the black community, black people were armed. So they never had to leave that house. But I do know an old man who was killed, but I don't know how. One of my friends says that they lynched a lot of black people on a hill called Sugarloaf in Sepulpa, but I didn't know about it, close quote. While Kudjo might have known anything about Sugarloaf Hill, Attorney Davis did and offered this explanation, and I quote, we had a hill in Sepulpa before Sepulpa started spreading out. You know, we didn't know any better. You know, innocence is something. I mean, it can really strip the meanness. It can strip the veneer away from the meanness, and it can strip the meanness away from the nice. It's just innocence. We used to ride our bicycles up the hill to see who would get up to the top. That was where they used to lynch the black folks in Zapalpa, close quote. These excerpts from Donald Davis's, Nancy Randolph Davis's, and Freddie Cudjo's narratives suggest that at its best, history is always an incomplete record. Thus, my research illustrates how oral histories as primary texts invite and maybe even demand that religious scholars examine and assign value to these non-scribal sources as repositories from which to reframe theological questions that force an examination of key issues and ethical problems that may not be addressed from multiple perspectives in our accepted canonical sources because of lingering, though often unacknowledged residual effects, lynching memories, comparative to slave narratives, offer a different lens through which to evaluate personal and communal values. As such, dialogues on and about lynching cannot and should not be ignored. Greenwood should never be ignored. Participants in my oral history project who resided in various sectors of the United States add depth to existing historical, sociological, and theological contributions on this difficult topic. Retired educators like Mrs. Nancy Randolph Davis and Dr. Freddie Fauché Cudjo, clergy, scientists, veterans, entrepreneurs, lawyers like Donald Davis, and laborers discuss lynching because for them, historical remembrance is an ethical mandate, a theological ethical mandate. Whether they acquired the equivalent of a first grade education or achieved the highest degree in their field, lynching narratives, when viewed as oral epistles, challenge us to reassess notions of courage and the sacred. From recollections of aborted lynchings and strategies of survival, Blacks who remember lynching invite me to consider how their stories shaped and still unfolding in the shadow of lynching trees influence what constitutes truth. Although blood or the threat of blood is etched forever in the recesses of the minds of many Blacks who came of age in the United States during a period marked by lynching and race riots and race burnings, their socio-historical recollections can function as points of entry. Entry points to provide the human community another frame of reference from which to examine diverse ways in which notions of civility frame narratives that offer insights about these individuals' human capacity to make a conscious decision, to go into their interior archives and to determine for themselves if or how they will give voice to a truth that reflects their own lived experiences. While I will never know fully the effect of lynching, oral historical accounts can function as a basis from which to evaluate strategies of resistance and visions of justice from which to determine and to construct an ethic of resilience.
as I weigh benefits associated with an excavation of truths embedded and embodied in the minds and souls of black elders, it's imperative for me to acknowledge that courage is, inter is connected intricately to notions of justice as persons look back to times past and reflect on current situations as a mirror by which to assess how truth-telling might inform a national response to hate-infused rhetoric employed to perpetuate a culture of fear. In this regard, courage is not an abstract trait. Rather, courage is a contextualized response informed by an understanding of self that seeks to actualize a prophetic mandate to do, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Thus, courage is a reasoned decision, neither to advance a conspiracy of silence to promote miseducation, nor to condone racial hatred. Quite the contrary, courage is a virtue that demands that we acknowledge that truth a way of knowing that is intricately connected to our lived reality, that when given voice and space, truth can have far-reaching consequences. A review of elders' vivid responses to culturally embedded and present-day responses to terror suggests, to borrow from Frederick Douglass's 1984 speech delivered at Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., there are lessons of the hour that continue to merit serious consideration. A particular concern for many oral history participants is how a lack of knowledge of U.S. history by a large percentage of a post-1960 civil rights generation particularly its citizens of African descent, contributes to a reenactment of a culture of lynching with persons ill-equipped to assess the import of cries to take America back, premised on a notion of exceptionalism couched in simplistic religious language. Embedded in this nationalist-like vocabulary is a disavowal of human rights that at its most fundamental level is predicated upon a perpetuation of mythological notions of privilege that often prohibit a forging of alliance across class lines. After all, evidence suggests that, there are, that some persons are so steeped in a false sense of racial entitlement, they choose to participate willingly in perpetuating stereotypical myths rather than engage in difficult but necessary dialogues from which actions to further a more just society might emerge. Documenting memories of lynching and a culture of lynching should not be predicated on current or proposed book banning and censorship legislation and initiatives. Whether memories of lynching and a culture of lynching are preserved for future generations is contingent, however, on several factors. For some Blacks, documenting these narratives is indeed, as I mentioned earlier, a theological ethical mandate. Yet to ascribe normative status to this position devalues conscious decisions to remain silent, not as an act of cowardice or historical complicity, but rather as an act of agency to preserve one's own sense of well-being. As a non-oral history participant in Sumter, South Carolina mentioned, consideration must be given to possible repercussions. After all, as this gentleman pointed out, to talk is also to live with possible consequences associated with sharing memories which could result in confronting a non-law-abiding past that is fraught with ambiguity and sentencing disparities. On the other hand, as Sopopo born participant Dr. Kudjo stated, and I quote, I think that people don't talk about lynching because when I was a little girl and they talked about it, I was fearful. The lynching was so horrifying, it made you fearful. It made you feel with a sort of gall that could have turned into hatred had you not had some successful things happen to you and the counteraction of the black church. The black church, though I was a Catholic, I would go to the black church a lot because that's where all my peers were. Black preachers would say, it's going to be bad, but it depends on you. It's not good enough to be as good. You've got to be better in everything you do. 
We don't tell children that enough, but we knew that fear because there, but we knew that fear because there were also little black girls being raped. So you had to stay away from certain areas, always be in a crowd. You knew that if black guys went to a certain area, they could be beaten up. We didn't say lynched, but they could be beaten up, close quote. The granddaughter of a Creole man whose paternal family traces its origins to Louisiana, Kudjo recounts why her family came to Oklahoma. She says, and I quote, some people in this Alabama community decided to teach my grandfather a lesson, which probably means lynching. When word leaked they were going to show my grandfather something, his white brothers and his father came to his house and asked him to leave town because they did not want this to go on. My grandmother said they threw things on the wagon. They grabbed up just half of everything. But my great-grandfather did help finance this. So they came then with their three small children. They brought them to Wagoner, Oklahoma. At first, my grandfather's and grandmother's family looked like a white family. So they didn't bother them at all. They were just off to themselves. But a black lady that I've heard spoken of as a sporting woman, I don't know what that meant, but I have an idea, stabbed a white man because he was beating her up. She stabbed him and she was dragged off and dragged to jail for that. My grandfather, they had to get involved. They had to say something about that. You just don't let a black woman be lynched and you don't do nothing about it. So then they were going to come after him. They found out his family was a black family. They were going to come after them too. So again, my grandmother said, they piled everything into a wagon and they went to Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Close quote. Forced migrations in response to massacres, lynching, and other acts of white supremacy are disruptive traumatic events that affect multiple generations. As we approach the 101st commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre, it is important to acknowledge that whether individuals share their memories of lynching or not, each, through a process of internal assessment, signals that courage and truth are not abstract ideas. Neither are these moral virtues grounded in notions of absolutism. Rather, remembering lynching narratives compel me to reflect upon lynching, to borrow from Dr. Emily M. Towns as a legitimate cultural production of domestic terror. Given this historical reality, courage and truth cannot be comprehended fully without a further explication of the role and function of symbols, tools used strategically to intimidate and restrict activity. When the very act of lynching and its primary weapon, the noose, are internalized to ensure a silencing of history, blacks who came of age during this death-dealing era offer insights into moral discernment that afford me another point of reference from which to examine the impact of sustained invisible wounds. It is also not surprising that I continue to gain a greater appreciation for persons whose lived experiences are antithetical to historical revisionary accounts proposed by some elected officials and educators. When employed as primary resources, these oral histories are further evidence that regardless of religious orientation, there are strategies of resistance and visions of justice that emerge from a culture designed to thwart a sense of human dignity that is of immense significance in a global capitalist society. To be clear, life in the shadow of the noose and in the shadow of community burnings is fraught with ambiguous tension. On the one hand, it is a reality complicated by traditions and compounded by a desire to give voice to practices that reflect the worst of human nature. On the other hand, this state of existence seeks to honor that which contributes to the well-being of all, to be co-participants in God's always unfolding community. As they recall personal accounts and stories that history books didn't talk about, Blacks who remember lynching share life-preserving insights 
on ways in which they confronted and responded to evil. This astute awareness allowed many not to succumb to build up hate, characterized by some as a process of personal healing that resulted, them, that resulted in them being able, and I quote, to put that hate down, close quote. Over time, they chose to engage in a de-internalization process that enabled them to name lynching as a byproduct of racism, which is nothing more than systemic sin cloaked in language that is used adroitly to manipulate a desired outcome. For blacks who lived through and now live with memories of a culture characterized by lynching, characterized by race riots, characterized by the burning of communities, to remember is to give voice in their own words about a time when they, and I quote, lived in America, the land of the free, but yet there was not freedom. There was a fear. That was the way they did things. The threat was great. You never knew when or where. Everyone talked in hushed tones about it. It was just something that happened, close quote. Yet even if trees no longer bear strange fruit, a proliferation of voter suppression legislation in multiple states and racial disparities within the U.S.'s incarceration system suggests that blacks remain in the shadow of lynching trees. Individually and collectively, there is a moral responsibility to respond in an informed manner if injustice is to be named and confronted wherever it surfaces. Given a growing media trend to disregard context in order to characterize selected comments, for instance, as racist or anti-patriotic, Black elders lynching narratives offer another glimpse into techniques that enable persons of moral courage to stare hatred in the face and to purpose not to be consumed or defined by dehumanizing behavior. These primary sources, a complement to existing ethical theological materials, emerge from and are informed by a particular historical period with yet unfolding contemporary implications. These are not sound bites. Instead, these oral histories are a snapshot into intricacies associated with archival data extraction that in several instances has not been accessed in years. As such, black lynching narratives are part of a canon of work that challenges us to consider what is required of us if our embodied actions are to convey that we are at both a personal and a communal level, socially responsible global citizens. From black elders who remember lynching, I understand better how being scared stiff can motivate blacks to exercise agency and join with others to dismantle an institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression whose continued prominence in this country is contingent on instilling fear-induced immobilization. Lynching in the 19th and 20th centuries left no one unaffected. We need only glance at postcards of some of these public spectacles to realize that white children gathered at the base of hanging trees carry with them, as do black elders, deeply embedded memories my conversations with several oral history participants are a timely reminder that chambers of horror and death, though hidden in plain sight, may be etched forever in the recesses of the mind. Memories of lynching and a culture of lynching are not the stories of fairy tales. One too many persons in the U.S. are reluctant to acknowledge this evil side of our national history. Rather than name racism as a national sin, there's a greater tendency, as Corbin opined, and I quote, to sweep it under the rug than to talk about it, close quote. Clearly, the continued deaths of unarmed black persons at the hands of police and others counter any claims that silence is an antidote to diffuse a neo-lynching culture that is based on a constructed ideology of white supremacy. 
At the same time, I acknowledge, as did Corbyn, that those who confront government-sanctioned practices of terror do so often at great personal and communal risk. Despite a national narrative of truth and justice for all, Corbyn rightly noted that how we respond to race and violence, and I quote, has a lot to do with fear. And the fear is not necessarily a physical kind, even though that does exist to a degree. You have a fear of retaliation by economic means. The suppression is still there. And now, instead of using the physical, we use the economic sweep, and it can be so effectively used on both white and black until it just makes it uncomfortable. Plus, you never know to whom you're talking, and so it makes for reluctance in conversation. Also, it's really difficult to face that because in a sense, you feel a coward because you don't face it. It's more comfortable to let it slide. And that's what we do. We take the more comfortable route, close quote. From persons who know that ignorance is not benevolent, we receive nuggets of wisdom that call into question notions of a beloved community that are compromised when privilege in its various manifestations condones behavior by individuals who are, and I quote, not bound by any of the rules that went on there, close quote. In the shadow of 21st century lynching trees, individuals who acknowledge the full humanity of all people are invited to seek creative and life-affirming ways to give voice to atrocities that daily put the lives of non-cisgendered heterosexual white boys and men and those who choose to pass as such at risk of murder, deportation, or other acts of violence. For such a time as this, an urgent question is not necessarily where is the divine in the midst of this entrenched pervasive evil. Rather, a serious consideration is how to experience the divine in such a way that life and not death will always be the final word. Thank you. At dinner last evening, uh, President Sims uh, said, will there be a Q&A opportunity? And I said, yes. And so I'd like to give you an opportunity to ask just a few questions. We're not going to uh, stay that much longer, but we want to give you an opportunity to engage uh, our inaugural lecturer. I was born in 1950, and my, I'm a fourth generation Tulsan. I never knew anything about the massacre, but what I struggle with is that I want to completely support reparations, anything that can write what was wrong. And I'm a little white girl from Tulsa. I worked in North Tulsa. I worked at our community health center in North Tulsa. I'm totally supportive, but I don't know what to do. I need help. Let me suggest that your very presence here tonight suggests that you at least have a glimpse of what to do, to show up to show up in spaces, to think about the ways in which you may need to examine your own four generations of life here in Tulsa, and, and to ask yourself, what are the ways in which your desire to want to make a difference will impact subsequent generations of your family? That's a good starting place. And to piggyback on that, I think a start in the schools as well. I'm an educator, and we could you could start there in the schools. Uh, so that's a good way. Yes. Okay. I um, have a question, a comment, to see if anyone are familiar with this information. My husband and I talked to an older gentleman, maybe last summer, and he was very upset. And he gave us lots of information. He said that the whole story has not been told. He says, as a young boy, 
He said black people were buried all up down Cincinnati. And he said all those outstanding buildings that they're building on Greenwood, he said there are bodies under that. He lived that. So I say tonight, that's a slap in the face that our people are buried under those buildings while other people profit and make money on where our people are buried. So my question tonight was, is anybody familiar with that information? So I will say that in my conversation with Attorney Davis, he did talk about the dead bodies being left. He did not mention whether or not there were mass graves, but he mentioned the bodies that were left as the residents were fleeing the city. One more thing, check with archeologists uh, because they may, may be able, there may be ways to do soil testing to determine if there are human remains on those sites. I was a little bit surprised when you mentioned attorney Donald W. Davis, he's my brother. Uh, <laughs> he, and Olivia's uncle, yes. Um, he passed two years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was curious about the oral history because he never told me that he was doing this. Um, so I was curious, wh what was your relationship with my brother? So I was introduced, I, context, I served on faculty at St. Paul School of Theology for 12 years. And I was a faculty member when I engaged in this oral history project. We have a campus in Oklahoma City, okay. and I spent about 50% of my time between Oklahoma City and Kansas City. And members of the staff at Oklahoma City, particularly uh, Rachel McLean, was very instrumental in helping me to identify and make connections with the black elders, uh, with, a, with several black elders. I must have talked to about 10 Oklahomians many of them tracing their roots either to Sepulpa or to Langston University. This, this is wonderful. So two things. Um, I grew up in Sepulpa, and you're absolutely right, Sugarloaf Hill, what Don, Don told you. And it was still, uh, it was still a warning that, that our parents told us as we rode our bikes. Now, I'm, I'm 16 years younger than, than Don. And... Um, we were told, don't go over there because that's where black people were lynched. So we know that that's the truth, that's Sugarloaf Hill. The second thing is um, the area that you, you quoted there outside of Sepulpa mm -hmm. is called Lowrance, L-O-W-R-E-N-C-E, Lowrance. Uh, Lowrance was an area south of Sepulpa that was populated by blacks and uh, Muscogee Creek Indians. And they owned all of this land. So black people had land uh, south of Sepulpa, but you know, all of that is gone now. And they call it something else, Lazy Eight tradition or whatever. But the point is, is that black people, no matter what has happened to them to drive them away, wherever they landed, they flourished. They built and they continue to do that. And that's the lesson to young black people who are facing a climate disaster and wondering how we're gonna do this, let me tell you something, God got you. <laughs> I wonder if a um, full circle is being drawn um, by the basis of your research being oral history of African American people and that being for our ancient ancestors, the way life was carried on. Do you see that that may be true in your research? So the power of story, um, the understanding of the role of the griot within our tradition, um, it's not something that I take lightly. Uh, and recognizing that the transmission of history across generations must always be delivered in multiple modalities, 
oral history being one of those modalities. And I, I question, as a theological educator, the ways in which orality often is devalued in comparison to that which is written. Um, and so thinking about the ways in which, from a theological educational perspective, how do we think about the ways in which seminarians are encouraged to hone their listening skills? Because it's in the listening that we learn. Yeah, I have a question. Why is it that most Europeans think that they can mistreat and kill and enslave everybody? So I won't feign to be able to speak for most Europeans, but what I will say is that if we look at world history, conquests, colonial, colonial, colonization, occupation, war, it's there. I often think that sometimes it is allowed to go unquestioned because of a misreading and misinterpretation and misapplication of the biblical text, particularly accounts in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And so as I do a close reading of, of, of these accounts in the biblical text, I'm reminded that history is always told from the point of the victor. So the question becomes, where are the other side of those narratives? Where the side of the narratives about the people whose land was taken, about the people whose culture was destroyed, whose lands were decimated? And when we think about the ways in which a construction of race and power has played out across the world, and the ways in which an unquestioned acceptance of wealth is held up as a value by which others should ascribe, then one could say that because so much of wealth is vested in Euro Europeans and Euro-Americans, without questioning the source of that wealth, then that destructive pattern continues unchecked. That's just one hypothesis. I really appreciate your talk. Thank you so much. And one aspect that I really liked was that you you warned us against trying to validate one particular way of telling a story. And um, there are lots of stories, there are lots of movements and communities here in Tulsa and elsewhere that are trying to work. Do you have any comments or thoughts about how one validates these different modes and these different decision strategies when this outside system is always trying to commodify this approach or this story? What happens when the way that we tell our story begins to be commodified and used by the power brokers or we need political support or these other things that then fracture? Can you just say something about because this doesn't happen in a vacuum, and the system is trying to splinter. Mm -hmm. So the commodification of human beings, it's an old story, right? It goes back to this gentleman's question. One of my hopes for Phillips community is that as you are introduced to more and more of the persons who are doing that work, what would it look like for Phillips to be the place where folks gather? Uh, where each person who's doing the work is able to think about the ways in which there are points of intersection, as well as to name the points of uniqueness. To also be mindful that, you know, the work does require funding, but to choose wisely your funding sources. Because as Katie Geneva Cannon used to tell me, Sister Angela, there is no free money. And so being mindful of who your funding partners are. But if 
this school becomes a site in support of truth telling and the righting of wrongs in this community, that's a really good start. I want to thank you once again for your presence, both in person and online, for your participation, your openness to hearing and exploring within yourselves this story and committing yourselves, recommitting yourselves, dedicating yourselves to this work that is before us. It is not easy work. It is not easy to hear the painful stories that we each carry, but it is necessary work for us to share with one another, to engage one another in conversation that comes from the core of one's being where the spirit actually connects us. So thank you for being here. There are many people who have participated in making this evening happen or making this evening a success. Many people who worked behind the scenes. Uh, so I want to first thank Sharon Russ in the academic dean's office. Yes, do applaud. I don't always know how to receive help. And Sharon was always insistent that I know how to receive help. So there were many days when she'd say, well, how can I help? And here's something I've done to move this along for you. So President Sims didn't meet Sharon because Sharon was still running around today, making sure things were as they ought to be. So we thank her for her dedication to the success of this event. And we thank our communications and IT personnel, Kurt and Joseph and Zachary. Uh, I'm appreciative of Ulysses Allen, who I asked Ulysses, I mean, when I first came to Phillips, uh, Professor Arthur Carter said, Ulysses knows everybody. <laughs> So I went to Ulysses and said, put together a list of everybody that we can reach out to, and he did that. So we thank him also for the work that he has done to make this evening a success. We have a special guest here this evening, someone who traveled from Houston, Texas, a famed artist, Mr. Harvey Johnson, uh, who came to be with us. He heard about it and decided he wanted to make the trip. And so we're glad that he is also here. And he came with another friend, um, Mr. Rusty uh, Tether. Um, Russell, but he said, just call me Rusty. So we thank Rusty for also being here this evening. We are very appreciative for Mr. Daniel Remain, Dr. Daniel Remain for his sharing with us this evening. He wanted to be here, but because he could not, he still chose to participate by pre-recording and uh, being present with us in a very personal way. And he was so gracious to work with, to collaborate with Miss Olivia Davis, and we're glad that she was able to be with us also. I thank my friend and colleague, President Angela Sims, for uh, truly making the space to be with us. She squeezed us between a couple of events. And so I'm just very deeply appreciative of her stretching to be here to become our inaugural lecturer. On the back of your program bulletin, you will see that there are some special contributors. Special thanks to those who were early sponsors to this event. Mr. Eric Branch of the Intel Corporation in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, the Black Church Traditions Program, uh, where 
Dr. Arthur Carter is the director. Much of the work that we have um, benefited from, from the art exhibit to uh, contacts and, and organization uh, was the handwork of Dr. Carter. We have a number of trustees who have also contributed to this event. Uh, Dr. Jenna Ray McNeil made a donation in the name of Buck Colbert Franklin, who was the father of John Hope Franklin, who Dr. Jenna Ray McNeil also co-edited work with, Dr. John Hope Franklin. So she is a colleague, former colleague of Dr. Franklin, and she is also one of my mentors in my life. And so we thank all these persons who have contributed to this event. We also thank President Nancy Claire Pittman, who not only supported this event financially, but also with great spirit and generosity, who has uh, been behind me every step of the way to make sure that this evening is a success. We also want to give you an opportunity to support this event going forward, that these events, the last thing that President Sims identified is we have to be uh, aware of sponsorship. And so if we pool our resources to ensure that this goes on, we make a great contribution to the life of this institution, to the life of this community. And on the back of the program, you also find that there is uh, information on how you might donate to the future of this event. So again, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the work that you are doing to bring justice to all. Have a good night.